Good day folks. In the last video concerning the three worlds, Nelson Barber and Charles Taze Russell, page 27, on page 25, uh, Barber and Russell are making us aware of the nature of the cultic, you might say the cultic obsession with prophecy. And in that, they replace the gospel of Jesus Christ, which has been continuous now for 1,800 years until Barbara and Russell came along, with a new gospel that involves the future. So the, we've talked about the gotcha aspect of this. That if, if indeed your, your gospel is about the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, you're going to need an interpreter because these books have mystified the church even from day one. And there's a history of false misinterpretations of these Gospels, so much so that John Calvin didn't even write a commentary on the book of Revelation, and yet he's the greatest of the Reformation commentators on the Bible. So he had a caution, and that caution has been, of course, fed by the con continual misinterpretations of those very two books. So here you have a group that says you need us to understand the mysteries of Revelation, not just the mystery of Babylon, but all the other mysteries too. And now, here's the second aspect of that gotcha good news, i.e., we're the only ones who can explain this peculiar doctrine of the invisible presence. So this is page one, uh, rather page 27, on the subhead, the manner of the coming of Christ, Barbara and Russell go where, of course, Jehovah's Witnesses still are today, i.e., we are the only ones in this harvest time who can explain this for you. So this is how they explain it. There are two classes of scripture in relation to the coming of Christ which seem contradictory. Behold, I come as a thief, and coming in all his glory. A thief never comes with a great sound of a trumpet, but secretly. Christ went away quietly, and it was unknown by the unbelieving, and is to return in like manner as they saw him go. Of course, these are texts from this last text is from Acts chapter 1, the ascension. He went into the holy place unglorified, and ten days after the Holy Spirit was given. The Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified, according to John chapter 7, verse 39. And he comes back in like manner. This also agrees with the law. The high priest on the day of atonement entered the tabernacle unadorned with those glorious linen garments covered with gold and purple and scarlet and studded with twelve kinds of precious stones and made for beauty and for glory according to Exodus 28. These garments put on after he entered were to be worn only while in the holy place and he was to leave them there when he came out according to Leviticus 16 verse 23. Thus he came out unglorified as he went in and it is thus Christ returns for no part of the law will wait or fail of a fulfillment. He did not go up to heaven in flaming fire, yet he shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire. Again, his saints are sleeping in the dust of the earth, and yet we read of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints, with 10,000 of his saints. The Lord my God shall come, and all thy saints with thee. These are texts in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 13, Jude 14, and Zechariah 14, verse 5. Saint means Elohim Yerag, that is God's seed. And both in Hebrew and Greek means the holy ones, those begotten by the Spirit and born of God, that is Christ and his bride. We also read of a period of time called the harvest. The harvest is the end of the world. And in the time of harvest, that is in verses Matthew or Matthew chapter 13 rather here we learn that the gathering of the saints is a part of the work of the harvest and it is taught in many places that their resurrection occurs only at the coming of Christ hence if he is to come to harvest the earth to gather his saints and is also to come with all his saints there must be two parts or stages of his coming this is a key teaching, of course, and it's, it's still kind of with us, not just in the cults, but in dispensationalism, where you have Christ coming divided into two, separated by at least a few years. With this view, and it seems consistent, these two classes of scripture become harmonious. 
He comes as a thief to harvest the earth or gather his saints. And he comes openly with all his saints, and every eye shall see him after the harvest is ended. If Christ comes in all his glory on, on leaving the holy place, it would be in direct opposition to the teaching of the law. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one jot of the law to fail. The laying off of these those glorious garments and coming out as he went in was made a very prominent feature of the atonement. Hence I would ask the reader for his own sake to be candid enough to admit that there may be more in regard to the coming than the one grand glorious outburst for which so many have looked. The harvest is a definite period of time called the end of the world, and the work of the harvest is of an entirely different nature from that of the gospel. One is sowing seed, the other gathering fruit. One is done by men, the other by Christ and the angels. And although both may be going on at the same time, still the work of the harvest must have a definite beginning. And as tares and wheat are to grow together until the harvest, and the harvest is the end of the world, that is the age, it follows that when the harvest begins, a period called the end of the age begins. Yet the living saints are not taken, up, uh, taken until near the end of the harvest. And as they are found in the mill, field, and bed, it is very evident the angels are invisible to them while gathering the tares, whether it be a longer or shorter period. And yet, notwithstanding this, it is not out of character to suppose, as they are children of light, that the day of the Lord will not come on them unawares, but the, that by taking heed to the sure word of prophecy, they should know their whereabouts and time of visitation. Because the change from mortality to immortality comes in a moment, it does not follow all the work of the harvest must be consummated in the same moment. It is not our object now to show the length of the harvest, but simply that there is such a time, and that it is to transpire during or yeah, during the mortality of the saints. Excuse me, this part of the photocopy is very faded. And that while Christ and the angels are doing the work of this gospel harvest, the world will be ignorant of what is going on, and the church, still walking by faith, will know the time of visitation only by the evidences drawn from the scriptures. Obviously this is very much still with us in the message of Jehovah's Witnesses that it's only by the signs of the times that we can actually know Jesus is present. But here's the seed of it. And we go on. It is, is it possible that a Christian will let prejudice or preconceived opinion keep him from an investigation from a purely Bible standpoint, of so important a subject. Nominal Christians will, and the first house of Israel stumbled over this very stumbling stone, that is, the fulfillment of scriptures in relation to the coming of Christ, in a manner they did not anticipate. And I am satisfied that you, who now hold this paper, if you are not already interested, whether you are a Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Adventist, Catholic, or whatnot, as you are part of the Laodicean Church, this also will be a key teaching for the Russellites. Revelation 3.14 is referenced here. Think that you are rich in a spiritual sense and will not give these things, that is, these new doctrines, a fair investigation. Many are called, few are chosen. If you are not one of the chosen, some excuse will be found. For it is, a, it is certain to come upon all the world as a snare, well, ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. The Bible so clearly teaches that the mass of the Christian world, and especially the leaders, will stumble, that it cannot be otherwise. So it's very clear from this that as, as far as Barber and Russell are concerned in 1877, if you don't keep up with this message, you are going to be among the sleeping, among the blind, when the coming of the Lord actually takes place, which is, according to so far what we've read, going to happen within about 40 years. Let me read that last sentence again. The Bible so clearly teaches that the mass of the Christian world, and especially the leaders, will stumble, and then it cannot be otherwise. So the, the message of the second invisible presence, and I guess we should actually get rid of the word second, the only presence of the Lord, because parousia is 
is actually descriptive of only the second coming. So the presence of the Lord is invisible. And this is the, a new teaching, it's an innovation, and if you want proof of that, we're going to attach a link right now which gives what the scholars of the churches have said about this, this word parousia, from which the word presence is derived. And also get into the source of this idea in the next segment, which is the emphatic dialogue of one Benjamin Wilson. So the link to the parousia video, which can also be obtained in a in a PDF, and also to a, a video we shot on Zechariah 14, which is alluded to in this section. Zechariah 14, a very visible presence of Jehovah. So that's on your screen as well. And next time we go deeper into the, the connection with the emphatic dialogue, this work that is not in general use except by the Watchtower in the last 120 years, even though it has a Christadelphian or, or a uh, link to the work that became Christadelphians, to be more precise, in later days when Benjamin Wilson, who did the Diaglot, broke away from John Thomas, who became the, as it were, the Charles Russell of Christadelphianism. So that's in the next segment.